Okay, terrific. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Luke Bovens. I'm the interim director of the PAR Center. And the PAR Center is a center um, on campus in UNC at Chapel Hill that stands for all things ethics on this campus. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Randall Harp from the University of Vermont. Um, he's an expert in philosophy of social science, philosophy of behavioral sciences, and philosophy of action. And he's coming to talk to us today um, about policing powers and policing institutions, implications for policing, police accountability, reform, and abolition. And without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to um, Professor Randall Harp. Um, he will be talking to us for about half an hour, and um, then I will ask you to raise your e-hands um, over Zoom, and then we can have half an hour of discussion. And so I would say, Professor Hart, take it away. Thank you very much, Luke, and thank you, everybody, um, for the invitation to be here. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for everything. Thank you, Luke. Thank you also. I see Sarah Stroud in the audience. Thank you very much as well. It's good to see some friendly faces. And I know there are a lot of people that were not able to make the talk today, um, which is, I'm, I'm sad because some of them are, are good friends and colleagues and others. I'm, I'm not worried because, you know, I, so I said, I'm, I'm nervous about this talk, as I'm going to say, this is, some of this is material that I do not necessarily work on directly. So some of this is a bit of a new area for me, and I'll say this, I'll say more about this in a minute. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, everything that I say today is very much an invitation for you guys to help me out in understanding some of this, some of these, some of this stuff. And the talk today is also going to be a little bit more informal than I might usually give. So as Luke suggested, I, I primarily work in the philosophy of social and behavioral sciences, philosophy of action, collective action. Uh, I do a little bit of work in um, data ethics as well. And as far as philosophy goes, I've done almost no work and I've had for a long time almost no interests in the question of policing. Uh, so why am I giving a talk today on policing? Now, I have, for the last couple of years, uh, done some work in Burlington, Vermont, which is where I am. I've served on the police commission in town, which is a kind of toothless citizen oversight board, right? It, you know, it's basically kind of um, advisory body for the police department. And I, when I joined this body, I didn't realize that it was necessarily a toothless organization, but I joined it because I was concerned about the state of policing in the country. And at a certain point, I said to myself, well, I can't just sit back and not do anything. I have to do something. So I didn't join the police commission in order to kind of bring any particular philosophical skills to bear. I joined it because I was just concerned about having been a black person in the United States for over 40 years and realizing the sorts of things that, uh, you know, the, the way that policing seemed to be going. And I thought something can or should be done about this. And I thought, if I don't try to do something, who will? Um, and I said, so having served in that capacity for a couple of years now and trying to see some of the ways in which, um, you know, ways in which we talk about trying to change or reform or abolish policing, some of the ways those discussions have happened, I think I have at least some, I've had some thoughts about how that is all going. And um, so like I said, so this is my first attempt to try to put together some of those thoughts, especially in the context of various discussions that are being had about uh, police reform versus abolition or about kind of what needs to be done with policing, how to make those changes happen, et cetera. So uh, my, the slides I'm going to present are also rather, I mean, they're just basically an outline for you guys to follow along. Uh, most of it will be just based on the discussion. So let me see if I can share this now. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. I hope it's this. Let's see. Oops, and sorry, so I've updated my OS recently, which means, of course, now that I need to change around all the permissions. So let's see if I can. Oof. Okay, so I'm being told that I need to actually quit out of Zoom in order to give it permission to share my screen. So I'm going to quit out of Zoom and pop right back in in 30 seconds. Sorry about that, uh, 
Jordan and Luke, but I'll be right back, hopefully. Okay, apologies everyone. Now let's see if this will go through. Uh, okay, so you should see the first slide, which is policing powers and policing institutions, blah, 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 blah. All right. So just the overview of the talk, are going to be, I just want to kind of touch on these four main topics for the talk today. First is what are policing powers? What do I mean by policing powers? And second, what would it mean to abolish or reform policing powers? And then third, talk about what is policing as an institution? And finally, talk about kind of what, you know, can the institution of, be, of policing be made better? Or is that just kind of a lost cause? So I really do want to draw this contrast between policing powers on the one hand and the policing institution on the other. Uh, so I gave this bit of background already, like why this talk, why now? Um, you know, I, I think everybody kind of has a kind of particular breaking point in some of these things. And my first breaking point with respect to policing in recent times was, you know, actually it was, you know, it was actually, it was not, it was not Mike Brown, it was not some of the other things. It was the case of Flando Castillo, who was, you know, a, a, a black motorist who was killed in the state of Minnesota, not too far from where I grew up. Actually, I grew up about four blocks from where George Floyd was killed. But the case of Flando Castillo happened you know, a few years before that. And this was a black motorist who, you know, was stopped by a police officer in, again, St. Paul suburbs and informed the officer that he had a firearm in his car as he thought it was his kind of duty to inform him while he was reaching for the identification the officer requested of him. And the officer saw him reaching for his glove compartment to retrieve his identification and the officer shot him. And this is also a case where the officer was not found criminally or civilly accountable for that killing. And that was the point where really I just, you know, I mean, first I, I spent several days just, you know, quiet in my room, where like, you know, how did this happen? And also, like, well, what can be done about these sorts of cases? What are we to make of policing right now? Like, what is policing even doing? What is it for? And like I said, and obviously there have been a lot of cases since then that have tapped, tasked all of our kind of collective patience with the nature of policing. But, you know, so how can I do something about that? And um, like I said, and I do want to draw this sharp contrast between policing powers and institution of policing. because so I think that everyone will agree that there's something that's gone very wrong about the way that policing is done in the United States. And I will focus on the institution of policing in the United States, probably because that's just the thing that I'm the most familiar with. But there are, of course, kind of peculiarities to the way that America does policing, which aren't necessarily uh, easily generalizable to other places. Uh, let's see where am I? Okay. So when I talk about policing powers, one thing I think as a way of kind of generalizing what it is that the police do is the police regulate disagreements between members of society. So I have to minimize uh, the video there. Police regulate disagreements between members of society. And um, policing is not the only state sanctioned way of regulating disagreements, right? You can regulate disagreements through the court system, for example, but police regulate disagreements. And I'm taking the term disagreement to be very, very broad. A, a disagreement in the most broad sense is just kind of any instance where, you know, someone might, you know, one person might say, I want P, and another person says, I want not P, or I want, you know, something which is incompatible with P. And so obviously a lot of disagreements do not either require or license the police to intervene. We can have disagreements about how long we want to stay here. I want to stay for six hours. You want to be able to go back and do your other things today. That's a disagreement that would not 
need to require the police involvement whatsoever. So at one end of disagreements are those which kind of involve public safety. So one person has an interest in being protected or safe against the actions of another, another person kind of has an interest that would require them to, to demonstrate that kind of force. Um, that's one extreme of a disagreement. But the other end of disagreements are just those which, again, people disagree and they don't agree on a mechanism for resolving those disagreements. Uh, and so just you know, anytime people might say, I, I want this, you want that, and we're not going to agree on how that disagreement gets resolved, oftentimes the police are in, you know, called for situations like that. Now, that's not to say that that's a case where police should be called for disagreements like that, but that's a case where police often are. Now, just think about some kind of example cases of disagreements which the police are involved in, which, which they have some at least putative powers, right? Um, so examples of calls for service the police receive are a homeless person is sleeping you know, in outside of a business or in a public park or something like that, right? Or there's a loud noise or a smell of drugs from someone's next door neighbor or someone overhears a domestic dispute that they worry might uh, escalate to violence or this kind of, these kind of catch-all categories of a suspicious person or suspicious event, right? Those are disagreements in sense because one person has an interest in exercising, you know, in performing behaviors of a certain kind, that person has some concerns about the way that those freedoms are being exercised. Um, and then when we think about kind of the, the powers that police have to resolve those disagreements, now, oftentimes, right, so police generally have powers to detain, to arrest, right, to um, question, but those powers are also granted just in the in the context of particular state, usually almost always state statutes. We're talking about state policing right now. So state statutes. And those statutes kind of stipulate what sorts of disagreements the police have certain powers to resolve one way or another. Um, you know, if there's a state statute that says, you know, that um, people cannot loiter in public areas for a certain period of time, then that's the sort of disagreement that the police now have powers to regulate. And that provides at least one clear mechanism for the police to resolve disagreements that are being held in public or private spaces. Um, but importantly, right, there are kind of two different ways of thinking about disagreements the, of that kind. There are the disagreements for which there's a clear statute that explains how that particular disagreement gets resolved. And in that case, people would say, oh, Nick, yeah, so this statute clearly says that you know, you can't have, you know, you can't operate a motor vehicle on these parkway, you know, in, in these natural spaces and in this kind of natural preserves. And so anybody who's driving a four-wheel vehicle and a, a motorized four-wheel vehicle in these preserves should not be there, right? That's a clear kind of statute-based disagreement. Other times, however, the disagreement itself seems to take priority. And what I mean by that is sometimes people call the police when there is a disagreement and they expect the police to resolve that disagreement somehow. And then the police essentially have to find some tool that they have in the statutes to resolve that disagreement one way or another. Um, you know, two people are arguing in a public space and they call the police or kind of one person is taking offense with something that another person is doing and, they, and, that, and then the police are called and they, and they show up and they recognize that this is, a, this is a disagreement, this is a dispute that will not resolve itself on its own. And the police, okay, well, how are we going to resolve that disagreement? We have to find some tool that we have in the statutes to resolve this disagreement because otherwise it will not resolve itself. So, and so sometimes the statute is clear about the tools the police have. Other times the statute is not clear. So this is just, you know, so, so this is a kind of disorderly conduct from, from the state of, state of Vermont, right? And, you know, so this is section 1026, it says, you know, a person is guilty of disorderly conduct if he or she with intent to cause public inconvenience or annoyance or reckless creates a risk thereof, one, engaged in fighting or in violent tumultuous threatening behavior, two, makes unreasonable noise, three, in a public place, uses abusive or obscene language, four, without lawful authority, serves in the lawful assembly of persons, or five, obstructs vehicular or pedestrian traffic. Now, this is obviously a very broad statute. If you make unreasonable noise in a public space, then you're guilty of disorderly conduct. 
And these are the sorts of statutes that police employ when they say, okay, well, there's a disagreement here and we want to resolve the disagreement somehow. And we don't know, you know, because we're, again, because we're worried that it's not gonna resolve itself on its own. What are we going to do? We're going to find some broad category like disorderly conduct to at least temporarily resolve the dispute. One person can be arrested if they're guilty of disorderly conduct. And then that at least kind of delays the problem for another day, as it were. Um, so let me actually go back real quickly. So the issue with, um, so a lot of times when police are called, they are called because they see the disagreement first and foremost. And then the question is, well, how are we going to deal with that disagreement? Sometimes those disagreements do involve immediate threats to public safety. Um, although, of course, in places like Vermont, which are open carry states, you can walk around with a firearm and that's not going to be judged an imminent threat to public safety because you're legally allowed to have a firearm. But if somebody is engaging in clearly kind of reckless or endangering behavior, then that is gonna be kind of an immediate threat to public safety. However, most of the time that's not in fact what police are called for and that's not how police are using the powers that they have to resolve disagreements in public. Most of the time, police kind of identify a disagreement that seems to be prior to the statute, as it were, and they want to use the tools they have to resolve that disagreement. Um, now, if those are the powers, if those are kind of ordinary policing powers, what are the problems with those? And of course, there are a bunch of, kind of problems, even just the way that we've laid out this description of policing powers, right? The first is just a question of efficiency. So when I talk about efficiency, I'm talking just basically about a kind of cost benefit analysis of using the police as an institution to exercise these policing powers. The first question is, is it the case that the most effective way to resolve disagreements is to wait for them to develop and then deploy the police to resolve them rather than resolve the disagreement ahead of time through some other tool that the state has to allocate resources, right? Um, if, you know, in, in a disagreement between, again, let's say, this kind of stereotypical shop owner and a person who is not homeless by choice, not unhoused by choice, right? It might be that that disagreement, I have this person, the shop owner says, I have this person sleeping outside of my business and it's bad for business. I want that to be resolved somehow. That disagreement might be resolved if the state were instead to deploy resources that would house unhoused people, right? People are unhoused, not by choice. That would be a way of resolving that disagreement prior to needing the police to intervene. And we can think of a lot of, kind of potential other resolutions of dis disagreements that would not require the police to intervene after this disagreement arises. Um, you know, any disagreements that seem to res that seem to arise from some need that somebody has. So think about kind of larceny or theft, right? Uh, those might arise from needs that people have. It might be that resolving those needs through power through other powers that the state possesses can prevent or obviate the need for policing powers to be brought into bear after this agreement arises. So right, when we do a kind of basic cost benefit analysis of policing, it might be that the resources that the state employs to exercise those powers to resolve disagreements are not actually the most efficient way of resolving disagreements. It might be more efficient to resolve them before they actually arise. Uh, the second problem with policing powers broadly described is what I'm, going, what I'm calling kind of statutory privileging of interests. Right? So right, it is not going to be a surprise to anyone that when laws are passed, laws are passed in order to privilege certain people's interests. Um, take a law about loitering, for example. Why might that law be passed? Because shop owners might say, you know, I don't want people to be loitering outside of my businesses. And I have the phone number of the state legislators and I will just ask them to pass a law that prevents people from loitering. Uh, very often unhoused people do not have access to create the laws that they would like to create. So, right, whenever there's a disagreement, there's gonna be basically kind of conflict of 
interests between people in a society and the sorts of statutes that are passed are going to privilege some interests over others and those generally tend to be people that are in a privileged position in society. So the mere fact that policing powers are kind of called in to enforce statutes means that that's already going to be privileging, responding to that previous privileging of interest that existed when the statutes were passed in the first place. Uh, but in addition to kind of the statutory privileging of interest, there's also what I'm calling discretionary privileging of interests. So again, there's a lot of discretion that uh, people who are exercising police powers, right now let's just call them police. There's a lot of discretion that people who are, who are exercising police powers have in resolving those disagreements. If two people have a, a disagreement and you, arrive, you as a police officer arrive on the scene and you want to resolve the disagreement, you might form a judgment about how that disagreement should be resolved. And then you as a police officer have the leeway to choose essentially kind of whatever statute enables you to resolve that disagreement in the way that you think is appropriate or best. So if there are conflicts, um, let's, let's take a kind of stereotypical domestic conflict right now between a husband and a wife. Um, and let's imagine just to kind of further uh, goose the story, let's imagine that the husband is a powerful and prominent member of society. A police officer who's called on scene might decide to, you know, that the best way to resolve a disagreement is to find a way to employ some statute to uh, protect the interests of the powerful member of society rather than the wife in this case. That is a discretionary privilege of interest, but that is, a, that is something that the police are always essentially going to have the power to do. Now, there are always ways to restrict discretionary exercise of power, but it can never be completely eliminated. So there's, you know, there's no way to be so uh, detailed in laying out the, the policies and procedures and statutes that it removes discretionary capabilities entirely. Uh, and then the last thing I was gonna say is just about general policing strategies. So, you know, I think people also kind of underestimate sometimes the extent to which the, um, the priorities of a police department are set by uh, you know, the police chief, the mayor, if the mayor is, you know, it has authority over the police chief or um, a city council, city council control the police chief or whomever, right? Those discretionary judgments are set by people in charge of police. So someone might say, you know, we want to prioritize quality of life offenses. And so that might mean, yeah, like we really want to make sure that we're using police powers to um, resolve noise complaints or we really want to use police powers to resolve uh, drug possession complaints. And you know, nothing in the statute itself requires that police powers be exercised in order to resolve it, unless, like I said, unless, kind of, um, it seems like, you know, unless it's something that's kind of imminent or there's no leeway whatsoever. But how you decide which statutes to enforce, what the sort of strategy would be of the police department is discretionary. And those general policing strategies, right, they kind of start by saying, okay, we're gonna find these statutes, but then we're gonna implement these strategies to enforce these statutes. And police are always gonna have the power to do that sort of thing as well. So policing powers are always gonna have a certain amount of discretion involved in them. And that discretion is always going to allow for certain interests to be prioritized or privileged over others. Now that's obviously going to be a problem when the interests in society are imbalanced or unfair. Uh, and I think those concerns that, you know, that, that those policing powers, that there's always going to be the possibility for policing powers to be exercised unfairly, and that's gonna be amplified in an unfair or unjust society. Those concerns I think have led people to say, the problem is just with policing powers in general, and those policing powers should either be reformed or abolished. Now, with respect to policing powers, though, I think that there are a number of claims that are made about kind of, right, so I think that when people talk about abolition and abolition of police, I think they're not all, people are not always clear whether they're talking about abolition of policing powers or abolition of police as an institution. And I think that when we talk about abolition of policing powers, I think that becomes problematic. Uh, but, 
you know, so when we think about a, a few kind of basic abolitionist, policing abolitionist claims, right? one abolitionist claim would be something like, nobody in society should be tasked with exercising police powers. You know, that claim, I think, is, it, it's hard for me to see how that claim specifically would work. And the reason is because, you know, even putting aside the questions of kind of imminent, imminent threats to public safety, there are always disagreements in society that might require somebody to be taken into custody on behalf of the state, on behalf of us, the people. So think, thinking obviously about a kind of ideal setting, and I recognize fully we're not in an ideal world, but policing powers are the powers to take someone into custody on behalf of the state when somebody is, um, when there's a disagreement which is such as to require that person be taken into custody. And it is hard for me to see how a society would kind of never have the need for such power, for those powers to be performed in some way, shape, or form. Now, people do sometimes say, well, you know, if you resolve all of people's needs ahead of time, then you will eliminate the need for any policing powers to be exercised after the fact. Right? We can get rid of all the disagreements in advance if we just if we just marshal resources differently. And so that's a claim that I think is sometimes made on behalf of the claim that nobody inside should be tasked with exercising police powers. But I just think that that claim is wrong. And I think that it's hard for me to see how somebody could live in America and think that claim could be right. Because one of the things that America has shown us is that some people's interests really are in the domination of other people. And that interest does not go away just because you give that person, just because you distribute resources differently. Right? Um, the, the fact is that sometimes interests are kind of group-based or group identity-based. And so people's interests might be in organizing society with respect to other groups or other interests in a particular way. And those interests don't go away just because you're kind of distributing resources in a particular way. Uh, you know, uh, interests that people have in, uh, you know, interests that white people have in subjugating black people, that men have in subjugating women, like those interests don't go away just because, society, just because resources are tasked differently. So, I, I don't necessarily see the possibility of completely resolving the need for policing powers performed, performed in that way. Now, another abolitionist claim which is sometimes offered is that police should not be performing policing powers, but someone else should. Um, you know, for example, I hear people say, and I, I know I'm going to push through some of this stuff. People sometimes say, you know, we don't want or need the police to walk neighborhoods, right? Just have a bunch of bouncers do that instead. Bouncers are able to exercise those powers much better than anyone else would be able to. And let's just accept right now that that claim is true. Uh, you know, bouncers are better able to de-escalate than the police are. Let's accept that that's true. That is not a claim for abolishing police powers. That's a claim for taking those police powers and giving them to someone else, namely bouncers. Because as soon as the, as the bouncers who are, who are walking neighborhoods, are empowered by the states to detain somebody who is violating certain certain statutes or certain kind of certain rules of rules that we collectively have set, then those bouncers are acting as police. And it's not police abolition to say we're going to make bouncers do that job instead. Uh, a third claim, uh, I'll do this really quickly, right? The claim is police should not be exercising any powers other than responding to imminent threats. Right. So that claim is something made well, what police should be doing is just staying in the station house in the same way that firefighters stay in the station house. And whenever there's a kind of pressing need for the police to respond, that's what they should be responding to. Now, I said, I'm not sure whether that's a reform claim or an abolition claim. And sometimes you know, the, the boundaries between those two are, are um, made kind of narrowly. But I think that the way that claim should be interpreted is as a claim that policing powers should be either sort of sharp, sharply curtailed or revisioned. So rather than having police respond to this wide range of disagreements, policing power should only be exercised for these kind of very narrow range of disagreements, those that involve imminent threats to public safety, et cetera. And that I think is again, absolutely the sorts of claims that should be discussed, but that's not a claim about kind of abolition of policing powers. That's a claim about 
identifying the proper scope of policing powers and who should be tasked with performing it. Uh, last abolition claim is, you know, police are always privileging some interests, that's always going to be bad, so the police should be abolished. And again, I, I think I accept the, the fact that police are always going to be privileging some interests. Police are essentially affecting the will of society, and when society has, is bad, as it were, then the police are going to be bad as well. At least it's, it's, it's very difficult to imagine the police having nothing but judicious exercise of police power in society, which is itself thoroughly unjust. But for that kind of abolition claim to be sustained, I think, there needs to be a clear articulation of what the alternative is. Right? So merely saying that there is a necessary wrong which is embedded in the exercise of this policing power does not yet say that that power should not be performed by anyone in society. What that's saying instead is that we need to identify ways as much as possible to mitigate the harms that are caused by that unless there is a kind of clear alternative that doesn't involve the exercise of those powers at all. And I simply just haven't really seen that clear alternative or what it would be. Uh, and I know I'm, I'm just about out of time. And I, I want to make sure that I have lots of time for discussion. So I'm going to push through this last bit pretty quickly. But in part, that's because this is the, the bit which is the messiest, right? When we talk about police institutions, uh, yeah, police institutions are very, very messy. They're problematic. They're historically contingent in lots of ways. Right? Uh, so, right, people will say, for example, um, you know, police in the United States are historically necessarily tied up with, uh, with uh, you know, slave patrols or with uh, the war on drugs or with the development of the automobile or various other claims. And I think that those are, those claims are right. And I think they're historically contingent, but they're right. Um, part of the question though becomes to what extent is that history of the way that policing powers, in, in, in the way that the institution of police in the United States has developed, to what extent is that necessarily implicated in the powers themselves that need to be, you know, that it, you know, if the first part of this talk was right, that need to be performed. And I think that they are not necessarily implicated in the fact that those policing powers need to be performed somehow. You know, there are lots of ways of, of working out an institution that would, that can judiciously perform police powers. And the fact that policing institutions are so overwhelmingly local, right, means that there's just a lot of different factors that make up how policing is done in any particular location. You know, there are questions about, you know, like whether, you know, who is in, how big a police department is, who's in control of that police department. Um, you know, is, is, the, is it a, a sheriff, is the police chief, is, is the sheriff locally elected or not? Is there some, some oversight or control by a civilian body or by a mayor or by a city council? Uh, you know, how are police trained? Is there, you know, is each department training its police directly or are they trained by a central body in the state that's not under control of any department? Um, you know, all of those things matter. And the fact that you know, in the, right, so the, the fact is that in the United States, right, you know, almost every officer, is going to carry a firearm, uh, you know, in, in part because this is America, right, which just means that everybody in society has a firearm and the worry among police officers is always, we cannot perform police powers if we are trying to affect them against somebody who has a firearm and we do not. Um, again, I'm not sustaining that claim, I'm just saying that's the claim that's often made. Um, and the, you know, as a matter of legal interpretation, right, the way the Supreme Court has interpreted the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments, the criminal bar for police misconduct is extremely high. And police are trained, almost every state for police training, police are trained that, you know, these are the legal standards for use of force, and they're extremely permissive. And so if you feel in the course of ex exercising your policing powers that you need to use force for these reasons, it is justified. Um, you know, one thing that I kind of always tell people when they're, when they're, when they're talking about cases involving uh, excessive force or police misconduct, I say, never ever be surprised either when 
you know, a state AG does not bring charges against a police officer or when a police officer is acquitted. Because the bars for demonstrating criminal neglect is extremely high. Uh, you know, that can be changed, but it can't be changed. You know, but that, right, sorry. Is that though, is that built into the exercise of policing powers? It is not, right? Can that be changed? Yes, it can. Um, but it's, you know, but the way that uh, policing powers are set up right now, the way the policing institutions has grown up over time right now, that's not going to be the case. So right now, the way the policing institution happens is every officer is armed, every officer is trained to see threats at every, in, in every spot. And if an officer perceives a threat, then they are now licensed to use a certain amount of force. Uh, all of that, plus this kind of general understanding that police are enforcing the interests of certain members of society against other members of society, is I think what leads to a lot of the problems. How does that get fixed? Well, a lot of that gets fixed by understanding that many of the problems with policing, I think, are problems about the institution. So there's no reason why policing powers cannot be performed by people that are trained in very different ways than the police are, are trained, or that are kind of embedded in very different institutions of, of public safety than the ones that exist currently. I think that, all, that can all be done. Um, but I, I also think that it's important to recognize that at the end of the day, there is going to be someone that is exercising those powers. And the question is, how do you prevent the harms from, the, from arising when those powers are exercised by someone? So I'll just close with the, with the case of Ahmed Arbery, right? Who, again, for those who don't know, or don't remember, Ahmed Arbery was someone who was jogging in, in uh, the state of Georgia and uh, was kind of questioned, interrogated on the street, stopped, interrogated, and then killed by two people in town. And it's sometimes, right, sometimes that case is incorporated into just a case of police misconduct. But of course, it wasn't directly a case of police misconduct because Ahmed Arbery was not killed by the police. Ahmed Arbery was basically killed by two people who deputized themselves as police officers. And, they were and this was complicit by the police department itself. So the police department said, yeah, yeah you guys can go ahead and exercise you know, control over other members of society as you see fit. You can decide, you can make yourselves police officers as you see fit. And I think that's the worry that I always have about any concern about making policing, about making the people that are exercising policing powers extremely local, is that in effect, we've tried that in the United States. And that's what gets, you know, that's what gets people lynched, essentially, right? And when, when people decide that they're going to be the ones to, to exercise policing powers, that leads to lynching. You know, what I think instead is that, you know, at least the ideal of police being controlled by, under control of society is that the people, you know, that the police departments are ultimately accountable to society itself. And that means that the priorities and the ways of privileging interests that the police are going to be uh, acting on behalf of, those could be interrogated by society as well. Uh, if you get rid of that, then what you have is a very hyper-local notion of policing, which is only accountable to very local interests. And given that local interests are often also problematic, I think that's not, in my mind, uh, the way to go. All right, so let's see if I can stop that sharing and let's see if I can bring back up the chat window. And that is my talk. And I apologize for going overly long, but I'm very optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards and, and any comments you might have, whether it's delivered here in this conversation or later. So thank you guys all very much for, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Harp, um, for this great talk. Um, now, this is a bit of a maiden voyage for me. But um, let's do it like this. Let's try it like this. So um, you know how to raise your E hand. You go there under participants and it says somewhere you can raise your hand. So I'm going to invite everybody to do that. And then I will simply call on, um, call on you. And we have about 20 minutes for discussion. Yeah, Pavel, why don't you unmute yourself and jump in? Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really, uh, I really liked um, the talk, but I, I, the whole time I have to admit, I was, um, I was waiting for a kind of uh, class analysis or something in, along the, the radical uh, tr uh, trends, right, that would give us an explanation of why statutes, for example, are applied unequally.
right? The standard, again, Marxist explanation would be something like, um, well, look, they're applied unequally because fundamentally, and I think you allude to this a little bit later, um, there are different interests that need to be protected, and this is part of the function of the institution of the police to apply them unequally, right? Consequently, you know, one of the, um, um, the, the claims for the abolition of the police, which is close to one of the ones you say, is that genetically built into this, this, this function of this institution is this inequality, and that's why we need to abolish it. It's not only that the police, you know, aren't going to be able to do it, but a police under these conditions won't be able to do it. So the, the long way around this question is, I, I guess I was wondering why you chose to go from an analysis of um, police powers down to this kind of discrepancy and, and not go for the more radical uh, literature um, approach, if, if that was done on purpose or not. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, so I think the answer that I would give to the question is, um, on my view, as you suggested, right, so on my view, so, right, so I, I don't think that anything, anything of what I said is incompatible with the things that you suggested, right? Um, on my view, though, essentially, there's always going to be that kind of conflict of interests between members of society. And so there might be some way, right, so we can understand why the conflicts of interests take the format that they do currently through all sorts of, of um, theoretical tools, right? including the fact that right, you, you, you can certainly give a kind of class-based analysis of why the conflicts of interests occur the way that they do right now in the United States. Now, like I said, I, I don't think that it's entirely, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think that a, a class-based analysis would do all of the work, partly because I think that, uh, again, I, I think that I find limited usefulness oftentimes in talking about kind of people or institutions as racist, just because I think that that's typically, like it typically doesn't go deep enough in explaining exactly what's going on. But I just think that, you know, like race-based interests in the United States are equally weighty to class-based interests. And so I think that kind of you can't explain the, the, the reason why these interests are taking the form, the form that they do, the reason why police kind of enforce certain interests over others, purely through a class-based analysis. That being said, I don't think anything I said was kind of incompatible with that. The question that I just had is, um, given that we understand kind of why the interests are the way that they are right now, I thought the question was like, what is the next step? And for me then like the next step is, what is the way to kind of completely get any kind of privileging of any kind of impermissible privileging of interests out of the question of policing entirely? And I think that there's almost, I think there's essentially kind of no way to do that. The only way to do that is to find the best ways possible to mitigate the effects of this kind of impermissible privileging of interest over others, given that that's always been baked into the pie in some way or other. So I don't know if that was a direct answer to the question, um, but that's the best answer I'll give right now. No, thanks, I appreciate it. I was nodding vigorously, but then I remembered that all you can <laughs> see is my amateur uh, author photo, so I yeah, yeah. <laughs> appreciate it. No, thank you. Luke, I think you are muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Lenny, you want to jump in? Lenny Schenkel. Hi, uh, thank you again for coming to our school and, well, coming to our school and sort of giving this <laughs> We do appreciate it. Um, I wanted to sort of jump back to your initial explanation of uh, what the job of the police is, is sort of um, an institution that solves disagreements. Uh, it wasn't a way I'd ever seen it before. It was very fascinating to yeah, that it really put some things in perspective. I was wondering, um, do you think that the police are trained with that explicit goal being conflict resolution and to solve disagreements? Or do you think there's a bit of a, um, I guess, a discrepancy there? Yeah, good question. I, for instance, it's gonna be yes and no. I mean, I, I think that police are trained very, very narrowly with a very, very specific set of kind of tools and circumstance, right? So I say, okay, so like, Here's the call that you get. Here's the debate. Here's the dispute. Here's how you resolve it. And and, and also, there's kind of a, a big difference between the way police are trained in academies versus the way that they're trained when they actually get when they're actually kind of uh, uh, when they actually get employed by a police department. And they're told, "Oh, like, forget everything you learn about in training. Now is where we talk about how, what real policing is." But I think that generally the thought is just, "Okay, like when you want to do this, 
here's what you can do and here's what you can't do, right? If you arrive on a scene and people are arguing, here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. Here's the level of verbal aggression that someone would need to display in order for you to, to, to use a disorderly charge against them. Here's what they would need to do. Here's the way they would need to kind of obstruct the police in order for you to kind of get them for this. Or here's the way that you need to do in order to get them for that. So it's, it's oftentimes just about like, if you want to get someone for something, here's the things you can do and here are the conditions that need to be met in order to do it. And implicit in that, of course, is, yeah, like these are the people you want to get and you just need to find some justification for being able to get them in this way. And what's also underpinning that is like, here's why you want to do that, which I think, and so that's never kind of made explicit in, in training or otherwise. But I do think that that's always kind of in the background of the training the police receive is you want to get certain people, right? And here are the tools, here, here are the tools that you have, here are the conditions that need to be met in order to use those tools. So I, I, so no, I don't think that police are kind of explicitly trained that their job is kind of uh, disagreement resolution. People that tend to think in that way are, you know, again, the, the people that are kind of setting overall department policy, the chiefs, et cetera, but they also don't think about it in necessarily kind of, I'll say kind of enlightened way. They think about it just in terms of like, here's what I need to do to get these particular metrics for how I'm doing my job to look better rather than worse. I appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Barris, you wanna jump in? Good afternoon, thank you, Professor Hart. Um, I'm Paris Miller and I'm currently the Vice Chair of the Chapel Hill Community Police Advisory Committee. And so uh, this talk is very uh, poignant and it speaks to a lot of the work that I'm currently um, doing in the community. And we've been very busy to say the least all summer and up to the present. Um, my question is dealing with, um, dealing with policy versus culture because I, I believe that culture will trump um, policy all day, every day. Yep. And so when we look at policing and the powers of policing, I don't want to take a reductive um, view of what policing is, because I do believe that policing, especially of Black bodies and public spaces, is something that... Um, beyond police officers is also done by other citizens. And granted, the police have different powers than a citizen has power. Those powers are still there and privilege and how certain people within the community and society can exercise those powers over black bodies is, is very different. Um, also, and if you could just, you know, kind of like speak to that and how that kind of like works with all of that and my second question is around the police being kind of a communal catch-all of all of the problems and issues and them having to show up and not having that policy to address the conflict. And so the role that like crisis units will play um, and how we should start thinking about that so that um, that conflict doesn't come into play when we're dealing with homelessness. And so police, we fund the issue of homelessness on the back end through policing as, you know, opposed to funding it on the front end. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. A lot of stuff there. So I'll, I'll try to push it through as quick as I can, but I'm happy to follow up this discussion um, if I don't cover it all. Um, so first, Clint, yeah, so I, I absolutely agree, right? I think at, at one point I heard a, a police chief say the phrase, you know, kind of, culture will eat policy for breakfast any day of the week, right? And I heard another chief say that and I heard another and I was like, okay, well, this is clearly something that they, like this is a phrase that they know, but it, but it, but it doesn't make it any less true, right? So you're absolutely right that, that department cultures matter quite a bit and policies matter less for a few reasons. Uh, one, I mean, and, and, and of course it's, it's useful, I think, to keep in mind that when we talk about kind of culture, that speaks entirely to kind of how officers are trained and acculturated within a department. That speaks to kind of the, the disproportionate effect that unions often have in establishing police culture, right? So police chiefs generally tend to be at a department for, you know, three to five years. Union heads are there for 20 some years. They, they can easily outlast police chiefs. Also, you know, when you look at, at George Floyd's killing, George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis, um, you know, the officer that was, you know, that directly had his knee on George Floyd's neck was a training officer, right? Three of the officers on scene were kind of being trained by that officer about how to do policing. So all of that stuff matters. Now, 
so I think that's absolutely right. And the question about how to actually change the department's culture, right? So that's assuming they're kind of leaving more or less the kind of public safety infrastructure of police departments doing such and such, such. If we leave that in place, then the question becomes how do you change department culture? And that's, you know, the, the equivalent of the big battleship and see, like you can't turn it around on a dime. That's going to take a long time to turn around. That's going to require kind of systematically promoting the people in that department and putting them in training positions that do the sort of policing that you want, that have the sort of culture that you want. And that's often difficult based on the way the rules are set up for unions, et cetera. So culture is super important. It's hard to change right away because just of all the different institutional uh, barriers that are in place to actually changing culture right away. You know, I think people sometimes get upset if a new, you know, if a kind of reform-minded chief comes in and people say, oh, like, you didn't fix this department in three years. So what's the problem? Like, well, they can't fix the department in three years, right? Uh, so, that, so that I think is, is an important point, absolutely. Um, how to change it? Like I said, that's, that's tough, but it requires like really finding ways to either you can change the department around entirely in, in an instance, which essentially was what happened in Canada. You know, they dissolved the police department in order to rebuild up and say, you know, if you want to get hired back at this new department, county level department, you need to re-ask for your job, right? So that's one way of kind of completely cutting out the impact, impact of the union and requiring every officer to reapply for the job so that you can fire all the ones that you don't want. Otherwise, you know, like sort of like systematically getting rid of every single officer that you don't want in a department, it's hard to change a culture around right away. That being said, policy, of course, does matter because policy is kind of a necessary but not sufficient condition for holding officers accountable. So if you don't have the policies in place, right, so basically that oftentimes officers cannot be disciplined unless they've clearly violated department policy. And sometimes department policies are thin enough that they just something like, look, if it's legally permissible, then it's okay by department policy, especially with respect to use of force. And that is absolutely not the level that we want because as we said, the legal requirement is so such a low bar to clear that almost everything is legally permissible. So those department policies can and should hold higher standards for officers with direct use of force than just, you know, if it satisfies Graham B. Connor, then it's okay. Like that's a terrible standard. Um, but even if you have the policy in place, that, that by itself doesn't ensure that an officer is going to be held accountable because somebody still needs to decide, yeah, I'm going to enforce this department policy, right? I'm going to, I'm going to actually like hold you to the highest standard I can according to that department policy, and that becomes a matter of culture again as well. So, yeah, so policy does not, like, officers on the street are often not just thinking about policy when they're deciding how to do their policing. They're going by what they've been taught by the training officers, et cetera. But if you actually want to hold an officer accountable, you need the policy in place. So policies are important, but not, but not everything that you need. Um, and then uh, didn't get a chance to write down the second thing that you asked. Uh, could you rephrase the second part of your question really, really quickly? Yes, so dealing with police um, departments being kind of like a catch-all and using oh, yeah, yeah, good, crisis good, good. Yeah. units, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so look, if I could snap my fingers and just kind of fix policing right away, like one thing I would do is actually, like, actually change the way that public safety is done. So. Right now, like what, what is involved in public safety? You've basically got police, medical, and fire, right? And right now calls kind of come in, they get distributed to police, medical, and fire based on how the dispatcher thinks it needs to be distributed. You don't need to have just police, medical, and fire, right? So you can have people that are also in the rubric of public safety who are first responders that are tasked with just, like, just providing services. So you can have that built into public safety. You can have kind of, you know, people that are kind of working with mental health crises built into public safety at a fundamental level, right? So it's not police re responding first, it's somebody who's, who's just tasked with doing mental, mental health who's responding first, right? You can have lots and lots of things in public safety that you know, are not policing, but which can solve the sorts of conflicts of, of interest that occur in among people in society. You know, some by society shouldn't be like, should be tasked with providing everybody with the resource that the state has decided it has to solve these problems. And, you know, Oftentimes, those are people who know that are social workers, et cetera. So, yeah, so I think kind of understanding like what the framework of public safety should be and what role policing, namely kind of the people who are, and I, I actually, I get in arguments with, about this with somebody who, with a, a former police chief who, you know, it's, you know, because I would always say, yeah, like, you know, the police, they have this kind of, you know, state sanctioned monopoly of violence. They'd say, no, that's not, that's actually not true, right? Because any citizen also has the power to use force if they see kind of somebody's life at imminent risk, right? So I can use force to stop someone from killing someone else, right? Even as a citizen, not a police officer, I can do that. Of course, now I said, well, 
does that apply if I see a police officer killing someone else? And that discussion, you know, kind of, but, right, anybody can use force, anybody is, is allowed to use force to prevent those kinds of imminent harms. That being said, obviously police have certain powers that other people do not have. Um, so the question is like, what role should people who have those powers and who are also gonna kind of pretty much gonna be carrying guns, what role do they have in a broader public safety framework? And that I think really, you know, so I'll say that's a kind of radical reform view, but I think that's probably the right one, right? Like, like, you know, like yeah, figure out what the role should be of that particular way of exercising police powers and then shrink that down to the size that it needs to be. But not every police power needs to be performed by somebody who carries a firearm. So again, like you can have people who don't have firearms exercising certain police powers as well. Sorry, that was a lot, um, but. I, I think we can squeeze in one more question. And I also, and I'm, I'm happy to stick around. So I'm, I'm not going anywhere at three. I'm happy to say if people want to. Okay, that's good. Let's take one more question officially, and then you know, if you stick around, and some people want to stick around, then uh, we can have an informal discussion too. So, Exxon Shekolaram, you want to come in? Yes. All right. Thank you, Professor Randall, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I want to just uh, build off on Powell and uh, Paris's excellent comments, and. Um, think about the place of police, meaning the position of police, can we think about it in a space between civic society and the state? Meaning, can we think about the position of police as an interstitial space of legitimacy of community in civic society and the legality of force of the state in terms of the function of the state, in terms of control and power. And if I want to complicate that question, if it is not already bad, uh, I can think about Althusserian notion of distinction between ideological state apparatus, meaning it's the schools, it's churches, it's um, institutions that are not officially uh, related to power, and it's repressive state apparatus, it's military force, it's police. Then, uh, you know, Paris's question that culture comes in would be interesting, meaning that whether we're thinking about the ideology of the state, of control of certain idea of order, we, we hear so much these days about, you know, order. And that is definitely a kind of falls in this idea intersection again between repressive state apparatus and ideological state apparatus. Order for sake of whom? To serve whom? So I'm wondering how can we think about the, the place of police and the idea of serving the public and the task of police in this positionality? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I meant to have a, a long disclaimer at the, at the top of this talk that there's a huge amount of literature that I have not read and still need to read uh, covering policing, right? Including kind of the, some of the, the political philosophy stuff, some of the criminology stuff, some of the legal stuff, some of the historical stuff. Like there's just a lot of stuff that I have not yet had a chance to fully get myself immersed in. Um, I, I would say in, in response, to that, and I worry that I'm not going to answer your question also as adequately as I should. But what I thought about when you were talking was, um, yeah, you know, there, there, there are, as you say, a lot of institutions that are exercising a certain kind of um, power for the state, and police are just one of them. And th the way that those powers get get effected or practiced are slightly different. But I think it's also important to note that you know the police are also not always exercising kind of coercive or physically coercive power, right? You know, police, like schools, churches, like other institutions, are exercising kind of non physically coercive power as well. As you say, and, and oftentimes that, that power is in order to establish what society has decided is the proper order for that society, right? So, you know, so when it, whenever certain members of society are judged to, to have their, you know, to be privileged over others, the police will be enforcing that one way or another, either explicitly or implicitly. Like even questions about like where police are patrolling, right? Because right? sometimes people will say, oh, like, yeah, if, if you want to imagine what police abolition looks like, just go to a suburb is what it says, right? And, you know, you won't see police walking around, you'll see police walking around in kind of, you know, enemy areas. That's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, so, so even the fact that kind of police are policing certain areas is another way of kind of non-coercive 
a non-physically coercive um, way of kind of exercising state control over people. Um, what does that mean? Well, again, I, I think that what it means for all such institutions, including the police, is that we need to have a very, very explicit eye about what it means to have police as a particular institution exercising what I take to be kind of legitimate powers in certain ways. So, so, again, I, so I think that there are some ways in which there are necessarily going to be problems with any exercise of, poli of legitimate police powers. I think that's always going to be the case. But I think that we at least have the advantage of saying, given that we know that there are going to be some problems with any exercise of police power, can we design the, you know, this particular way of an institution which exercises police powers in a way which minimizes those sorts of, of, of negative costs? And I think that um, there are ways so that if we pay careful attention to the ways in which police are exercising these kind of physical coercive and non-physical coercive powers on behalf of the state and say, like, can, we, can we find ways to minimize that? So that's, so that's my thought. Is that, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm happy with extremely radical ways, even up to kind of abolitionist ways of reforming the way the police institutions happen right now, because that's a particular way that we've decided to have the state affect those policing powers. But in my mind, I guess, so I, I guess the, the only point of this talk was just to draw a distinction between engaging in that project, which I think is legitimate needs to be done with, with the project of kind of getting rid of policing powers entirely, which I think is much more difficult, even though I recognize that once you have the powers, then you're going to have some of the costs as well, is, is my view anyways. So actually, I don't know if that was an answer to your question, no, but thank you. Thank, you. thank you for the question. Yeah. Terrific. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our session. Um, thank you very much, Professor Harp, for this, you know, wonderful uh, presentation and the discussion afterwards. All the discussions, th discussions. Thanks very much too. So I propose that um, you know we thank our speaker. You know how to do that with the, the e hands. Um, and um, if this works for you, Jordan, we could keep the channel open for a while longer for those people who want to talk directly. Is that okay? Yep, that, that works fine. Terrific, okay. Thank you guys very much. You know, this, this, this was not the, the visits to UNC that I might have envisioned in my dreams, but, uh, it, it, but I very much appreciate all of the uh, questions and comments. And I said, please feel free to email me if you have any other comments which you didn't get a chance to talk about today. I'm, I'm eager to hear all of it. So thank you very much.